Hi everybody, it's Francie. Welcome back. Today I want to have a chat with you about some terms I'd like to define. Culture is made in our hearts, in our homes, in our churches, in our communities by the words we use. And the further into this mission, ministry, project that I venture into, the more I realize how important language is and how important the language I choose to use regularly is becoming in my own life and in my family's life. And it's odd because sometimes when you go outside of your circle, outside of your family, and you use words that make sense in your home, they don't really resonate as much with other people outside of your home because you've created a culture in your home and everyone knows what you're talking about. So I wanted to reestablish a little bit of familiarity with some terms, one term in particular, and how I'm using it in my own journey and on this podcast. And um, I want to be clear with it. And I want to also continue to grow it because I think it is a very important word. And it's a very important focus for our discipleship, for our maturity, for our healing, and for the ways we pass on not only health and sexual maturity to the next generation, but the gospel because we've done a great disservice over the years and generations because of a lack of this word. The word is integration. It's kind of a buzzword these days. I don't think I'm the only one using it. I know I'm not, but it's been so pivotal in my journey. So key, absolutely key in my journey that I just wanted to pause kind of the regular conversation and make sure we all are on the same page and we all are sharing a common sense of understanding with this word. So let's pray. God of heaven and earth, king of all creation, I thank you that there's not one part of this good universe that you've made that goes without your loving gaze. Not one part. I thank you that in your kingdom and in your heart, there is not a sense of disjointedness, but there's a sense of rightness and order and alignment. I pray, God, for the grace in my own life to align with your design. And I know that I'm on a journey. So any ways that I am out of alignment, Holy Spirit, bring me into alignment with your heart, your word, your truth, your design. Because I know that you are a wise designer and there is abundance as I look to the things you've made and the order that you've created. And I I celebrate from that place of wonder and discovery to know who you are through what you've made. So Lord, lead us and guide us into your truth, into your healing, into your presence in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. I wanted to talk to you about the word integration. I use it a lot in my home, as I said, and on this podcast. And I just wanted to just state it plainly and have like a pause where we get on the same page. So um, if I look up integrate, the meaning for integrate is to combine one thing with another, so that they may become a whole, right? I understand that um, (laughs) integration could mean a lot of things in a different, in a lot of different contexts. And what I also understand is disintegration can mean different things. But when I think of the opposite of integrate, meaning to bring things together to make a whole, I think of taking something that was meant to be a whole and separate it into disjointed pieces. What I also find beautiful and amazing is that as I look to scripture to define integration, I see 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 through 28. This is the message version because it's just beautiful. But it says, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together spirit, soul, and body. And keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. There's a lot happening in our world right now. There's a lot happening culturally. There's a lot of longing and desire for integration across the board. You'll see it through different, um, you'll see it through different movements, through different social movements, through different religious movements. Everybody's longing to figure out what it looks like to be integrated. Everybody's longing to look to sources and experiences to make them whole. And what I see in this first Thessalonian scripture is that it begins with God and ends with Jesus, the God himself, the one who makes everything holy, holy and whole. And so I think that's where I want to start is oftentimes our mistake, my mistake is that I've made things that God has called holy. And I've said, that's unholy. 
and I'll just say it straight up, it's my sexuality, my femininity, my body, and my capacity to receive pleasure. For many years of my life, I assumed that pleasure was unholy, that sensation in my body was unholy, that arousal was unholy, that orgasm and a feeling of pleasure in my body was unholy. Who ever said that any of those things are unholy? Who was the creator of all of that? Who was the designer of all of that? We understand that lust is unholy and we understand that adultery is unholy. I think we can all 100% agree with that. But since when did sensation in my body become unholy? Just because I have a, a sensation in my body doesn't mean that I'm lusting, doesn't mean that I'm having adultery. It's a sensation in my body. But when for so many years I was convinced that that was dirty and shameful and bad, I disconnected from it. Hence, disintegration. And then when it comes to getting married and supposedly enjoying a, an abundant sex life as a Christian who was trying to honor God, what happened is that I had no neural networks available to agree with the fact that what I was feeling was okay, good, or holy. I was convinced that it wasn't. I had come into marriage wholly in terms of being trying to be set apart for God, trying to live a pure life, but I was unholy and unwhole in my capacity to connect my sexuality and my spirituality. To me, just because you're a virgin doesn't mean that your sexuality is holy. What it means to be holy is to be wholly connected to and committed and consecrated to God. And that includes sexuality. It includes, includes your capacity for arousal and orgasm. It doesn't mean you're acting on it all the time. It doesn't mean you're activating that space all the time or fanning that into flame. But it doesn't, being having the capacity for those feelings and experiencing those feelings doesn't mean you're unholy. It doesn't mean you're unfit for the gospel. In fact, God has made it all holy and it's all good. And so one of the things that I've had to wrestle through as a woman, as one pursuing holiness and godliness and longing to give God glory for my life, is how do I live integrated? How do I connect those parts of me that used to think were incompatible, my sensuality and my sexuality and my God part, my, my spirituality, how do I reconnect those without this lurking feeling of shame and fear and this uneasiness in my gut of this, this is probably not okay to feel this. It's not okay to let go. It's not okay to receive. It's not okay to just get lost in the moment because for so long, I, my nervous system had been conditioned to put the brakes, put the brakes, stop. Whoa, this is too much. This is bad. Again, this is not a comment on boundaries in dating. I think boundaries are healthy and wonderful, but it is a mindset that I carried with me into marriage that I saw my sexuality as, as unholy. And I saw sensuality and sensation as unholy. And there were not many voices to counteract that. And so as a woman who's been told most of my life that my body needs to be covered because it's dangerous and can cause a brother to stumble, there's just so much disintegration. And I would call that unholy. So what does it look like for God to become the Lord of my life, the Lord of my sex life, the Lord of everything that I am as a human being made in his image? How do I make him the Lord of all of that? How do I give him glory in all of that? How do I call all of that good like he did? That is the call to integration. It's the call to be able to look at what he said is good and agree. This is good. That is the capacity to have an orgasm. For a man, it's the capacity to wake up and have an erection and not be ashamed of that. It's the capacity to realize that we have an ability to feel incredible pleasure, get lost in a transcendent state of pleasure in marriage to the point that it can wash away our stress. It can reset our immune system. It can help our sleep. It can boost our capacity to fight illness and it can boost our capacity to fight pain and to um, experience a whole chemical of brainwash that allows us to feel happy and close and bonded. I mean, it's the most beautiful gift that God could have given us and we're scared to death of it. And so we disintegrate, we separate, we create spaces where God didn't mean for there to be spaces. And what happens is unwholeness and unholiness. And so I'd like to use the word integrate a lot. I'd like to use it often in my own life, in my home, because I think that's what it looks like to become holy is the different parts of me that are scattered and broken, come back together under the banner of the name of Jesus, under the redemption work, redemptive work of God through Christ on the cross. 
and he calls it all holy and he calls it all good so that as I'm discovering pleasure in my marriage, I can do it with a sense of confidence. I can do it with a sense of purity, with a sense of joy, knowing that what God called good really is good. And that there's an invitation to take what was meant to be harmful, which is our bent sexuality, and point it right back to our creator and say, God, make me holy unto you, which means bring all the broken pieces back together into one conversation where you're the Lord of it and you're the healer of it. And is this a journey? Yes. And might it be messy? Yes. And is that okay? Yes. But the space is and the invitation is to put the light back on, turn the lights on in your bedroom, turn the lights on in the rooms of your heart to know that there's no space for shame or darkness or hiding here. That was the work of the enemy in the garden is that they were naked, originally naked and unashamed. And once the enemy got through with them, they were clothed because they were naked and afraid. We don't have to be afraid. We can bring it all back under the name of Jesus, pursue his healing and his wholeness, and know that he is working out good things to make us fit for the coming of Jesus. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. Make you whole, put you together spirit, soul, and body, that your spiritual elements of your life that your soulish elements, the elements of your will and your desires and the cravings, struggles, functions of your body, that all of it would come under the name of Jesus into the light of his love, knowing that he designed you, that he fashioned you in your mother's womb, that your form was not hidden from him, your genitals were not hidden from him, your capacity for arousal and excitement was not hidden from him, and that especially as a woman, who has struggled to receive pleasure, realizing that receiving pleasure is actually your God-given design. There's no mistake about it. Your entire body was designed by God, a God who knows you and designed you and ordained you to be a pleasure magnet, a beauty magnet and a beauty magnifier. And in walking in that way, in an integrated space, knowing that you can be fully yourself who loves God and fully yourself who is enjoying pleasure and all of that is glorifying to God. And as a man, you don't have to be ashamed of a sex drive. You don't have to be ashamed of a desire for intimacy. You don't have to be ashamed of passion because all of that was ordained by God. And as we allow him to reorder our spirits, souls, and bodies under his name, under his forgiveness, under his cleansing power, and we can celebrate the goodness of his design, educate on his design, understand it, we can integrate. We can come back as a whole and know that he's pleased and know that it's a journey, but it's a journey worth inviting him into because it's our birthright to be image bearers, to be humans, to be embodied. And as we give love and receive love with these bodies, we learn what it means to glorify God with our bodies as ones who house his very spirit in these bodies. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word integrate. Thank you for this invitation to take the parts that have been separate and scattered and bring them back into a place of wholeness. Thank you for your design and your goodness as it relates to our sexuality and how you called it all good. In Jesus' name, amen. I do want to add a little PS here. This is the type of conversation I have monthly with the circle members. We uh, circle up And I love to call it the circle because it's not a hierarchy. It's not a show of someone who's large and in charge and famous. It is a circle of sisters who talk monthly about these very things, about the healing of God, about the redemption of God, about practicals, what it looks like to actually work this stuff out and the power of praying for one another, the power of vulnerability, the power of sharing, the power of understanding that we all are on a journey in different places, but we can still encourage each other with the witness of what God's doing in our lives. That's what integration looks like in Christian community. It looks like a space where we're not afraid to talk about sexuality. We're not afraid to talk about desire or pleasure or the process of healing. We're not afraid to have questions because Fear is not a part of our framework anymore. It is a space where we are saying God set us free and freedom and fear don't go in the same conversation. I know that from personal experience because fear has been my mode a lot of my life. 
and he's setting me free. And if you want to walk in freedom too, and if you're a woman who is interested in joining the circle, check out the link in the show notes or on my website, because it's been a very fruitful place of integration and you're invited. Okay. Take care guys.